All right, the title for today's class. Um, as you can see up there, how do, you make, how do you make lemonade when even the lemons have gone bad? Uh, right, because we have these sayings, um, and you guys can help me finish these sayings, but if life gives you lemons, make lemonade, right? Um, Sometimes we get in a bind or we see people get in a bind and we tell them, just pick yourself up by your, what? Bootstraps. Yep, bootstraps. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, move on. Um, and then, of course, when, when we see people struggle, sometimes we like to point the finger and we say, you dug your own grave, you can lie in it. Isn't that nice? Isn't that a comforting thing when people are down, right? Oh, you dug your own grave. You can lie in it. What if sometimes the lemons that life gives us are rotten? What if we can't make lemonade, right? I understand the sentiment behind that. Um, but what if life is so incredibly crippling that we can't make Lemonade. It's, it's a nice thought. Eh, just make lemonade. Life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Okay. Um, what if you're too weak to just dust yourself up off and pick yourself up by the bootstraps? What if instead you need somebody to reach a hand out and to help pick you up? And what if it's not you digging your own grave, but it's somebody else, <laughs> your, your spouse in the backyard. Well, where, what happened to Natalie? Uh, <laughs> and where did my pick and shovel go? Um, no, what if, what if you're being oppressed? Or what if life just sucks? And, and, and what if... What if people are just trying to survive? Uh, it's not that they're digging their own grave. It's that sometimes people make bad decisions uh, because they're just trying, they're trying to survive. Uh, what do we do with all that? There, there's an article that um, published yesterday on Washington Post. Um, and since we gave to Haiti last week, and I'll talk about that. Uh, by the way, incredible job, church, um, because we... We raised $3,000 last week just with our congregation, in addition to our regular contribution, and the church matched that $3,000, so $6,000 went to Haiti this past week. So bravo, bravo, and there's more coming in. Um, and we have volunteer opportunities um, out at the Weimers. Uh, we're going to organize that, and we're going to raise more money and send it down. But this article was, uh, was posted yesterday on um, the Washington Post. Uh, the title of it is, As Haiti's Crisis Worsens, A Rising Number Flee by Sea. There's nothing for me here. Um, Haiti is desperate right now. This is actually a picture of, of a guy by the name of Jeff Pierre. Uh, Jeff Pierre has a two-year-old son. And in the article, it talks about Jeff talking to his son, his two-year-old son, hugging him saying, I'm going to get on a boat, and I'm headed for the United States. You may never see me again, but I have to at least try to make life better for you. In a desperate attempt to flee the country, to make life better for his son, he left his son behind, which is incredibly common in Haiti. Um, I think I talked about this a little bit last week, or maybe on Wednesday. Uh, but in Haiti... Uh, it's not uncommon at all for people to drop their, their kids off at an orphanage and they flee, or a hospital. They just drop their kid off and they run. Um, they're not doing that because, because they hate their kids. In fact, it's quite the opposite. They do it because it's a last-ditch effort to try to spare that child's life. It's an act of grace. It's an act of mercy. And in their mind, it's the only way possible for them... To, to, to find life for their child, to have their child survive. Because the thought is, hopefully the orphanage will take them in. And Steph and Ronnie, when they were living in, in Haiti, 
They were faced with this often. They had to decide whether to keep a baby that was dropped on their doorstep or whether to send the baby out into the streets. I mean, think about that for a second. And think about the things that, that we complain about, uh, that we struggle with. Not saying that they're illegitimate struggles or illegitimate complaints, but in comparison, to try, to, to not try, to have to make that kind of a decision. Do we have the room to keep this baby? Or do we send the baby out trying to find somebody who will take care of the baby, knowing that most likely this baby is not going to make it? I mean, they were routinely faced with those decisions that they had to make. Routinely. Uh, and that weighs on you after a while. So right now in Haiti, um, this is the current issue. This is the current climate. There are people fleeing en masse. And so the story kind of followed, um, it followed Jeff Pierre and the 48, 49 other people who jumped a boat. They paid $250 US, uh, which is an exorbitant amount of money for Haitians. Um, they paid the money in a desperate attempt to get to, to the United States. Um, as you've heard in the news, there's an increasing number of Haitians who are coming across the Mexican border. Well, how did they get to Mexico? Um, they ride in boats like the one that you see in the picture here. Uh, they cram them as full as they can possibly get um, to the point of, of the boats practically sinking. Uh, they set out for sea. They don't have modern GPS equipment, um, navigation equipment. Um, they don't have electric motors. They don't have ways to really sail these boats safely. They way overload them. The people know that it's unsafe. It's not like they're uneducated and, and they're, you know, they're bumbling idiots. They know the risk that they're taking. Um, and so Jeff Pierre and all these other people got on, on this boat uh, it had sections that were rotten, um, and they got into some areas uh, heading towards Cuba, and the currents are really strong. It's really dangerous in, in the Caribbean. There are certain parts that, that sink even big boats um, because the currents are just crazy. And they got into one of these currents, and, and the rudder snapped. And so they're trying, to, they're trying to navigate the boat uh, using what junky electric motors they had on the boat, um, and they see some land. And the captain thinks that it's Cuba, uh, just based on some of the natural navigation that he was using, using the sun and the moon and things like that. Uh, and they see people on the beach, and the people are waving them down, <clears throat> and uh, they end up making, making land. They go on the beach, the people of Cuba help them out, they feed them, uh, they offer to, to give them tools to help fix the boat. <clears throat> they patch the boat the best they can, and they start heading for the U.S., for here. Um, they get out to sea a little bit, and the boat just starts disintegrating. And the captain says, we're officially lost at sea. Um, and I believe uh, the, the U.S. Coast Guard ended up, uh, sees this boat with st struggling people, uh, and they swept them up, and they brought them back guess where? Back to Haiti. Um, and so rinse, repeat goes the cycle again. And so Jeff Pierre said, if another boat is leaving and I have the money to do it, I'll jump on that boat in a heartbeat. I mean, the level of desperation is that high. So what do we do when life gives us these lemons and they're rotten or we're not even getting lemons? Um, how do we press on? How do we move on? What do we do about it? Um, I think it's a practical question, and this is not, this is not hyperbole, this is not um, speculation. This is to say that people's lives are like this all over the world, uh, including here in the United States. There are people who are struggling, people who are desperate, people who've had loss upon loss upon loss. What do we as Christians do about it? Um, I'm getting increasingly convicted um, that we've been, I mean, I, I, I'm aware of this, so it's, it's not like it's this big aha moment, but, but we've been focused here in the United States on growing churches, right? That's, that's been our focus. Let's grow the church. Let's, 
Let's make it healthy. Let's make it sustainable um, so that we don't need help from any other church. And we're going to be a church unto ourselves, right? Uh, isolation. Uh, that is a very American concept. Um, to have these churches that don't depend, they intentionally don't depend on other churches, they don't interact with other churches, they don't network with other churches. And so we're seeing all these churches like dominoes falling in the United States. And we look at that and we're like, well, it's, you know, corrupt government, right? It's um, restrictive policies. It's... Um, Mask mandates, it, you know, on and on and on and on. We're saying, well, this is why, well, COVID hit. And that just, that was the nail in the coffin. And people quit coming because, you know, because of safety concerns. And now the church is kaput. And I step back from that from a minute because it's easy to get sucked into that. It's easy to get wrapped up in that, in that mindset because we are Americans, right? We, we were born here. We grew up here. <laughs> <clears throat> it's easy to get stuck into that, that mentality, but then when you step back, you're like, what an American thing to say. That, that life, life has given us some bumps. I mean, we're not talking... I mean, last time I checked, none of us are so desperate to flee to another place because we can't eat our next meal, that we're willing to leave our two-year-old children behind, right? I, like, I'm unaware of anybody who's in that bad of a position right now. And so the things that we're facing right now as, as a church, as a culture in America are, are bumps. They're painful, sure. Uh, we should validate that. Um, but it's not this. And so how do, we, how do we rethink and how do we restructure? Well, I happen to believe that the Bible has all of the answers. Um, and Jesus, in, in Mark chapter 10, um, has this incredible conversation, and, and here's how it goes. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him, and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from, from my youth. And by the way, I, I believe him. I don't think he's exaggerating. I don't think, I don't think he's a bad guy. I don't think he came to Jesus with ulterior motives and was like, what can I do as the bare minimum to, to squeak by and get into heaven? I, I don't think this was a gotcha moment. I, I think this man was genuinely sincere. What do I got to do? I mean, am I good enough? And don't we struggle with that sometimes? Or oftentimes, am I really good enough? As a Christian, am I doing enough? Am I good enough? Am I helping enough people? Um, do I get out enough? Do I have enough faith in God? Do I have enough faith in fellow man? Do I partner with other people um, to make other people's lives good enough? Um, do I love God with all my heart, soul, mind? Uh, do I love my neighbor as I love myself? Right? We, we struggle with those things, and I think that's what's going on with this guy. Um, Verse 20, and he said to him, that is, the guy said to Jesus, Teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And, and this is incredible to me. Don't underestimate the power of this next verse. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. And here's where we see a shift in the man's persona. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. 
Um, I want to pause there for a second because I think there's so much going on in this story. And I think, I think this is a story that we as, as wealthy Americans can relate to a lot, right? Um, I don't think that Jesus is saying, oh, it's a sin to have wealth. I, I don't think he's saying that. Clearly, Jesus uh, interacted with wealthy people. Um, you have Matthew, right? One of the disciples is, is a rich tax collector. Matthew was wealthy. Um, you have other people who are probably less so. Um, but you have these people who, who had this great wealth, and Jesus never tells them, you know what, like, not good enough. Um, your wealth is, it's tripping you up, man. Like, you got to get rid of it all and give to the poor. There are times where Jesus says nothing about people's wealth, and there's no evidence anywhere that people dump their wealth. So I don't think the point of this story is that wealth is bad and it's going to send you to hell. I don't think that's the point at all. What I do think is that Jesus is challenging the man's heart. I think he clearly knew this man's heart well. Um, I think it's evidenced just based on the text that the man had an attachment to possessions. I mean, Jesus wasn't telling him, depart from your two-year-old son and come follow me. We're not talking about people, we're talking about things. Go sell your possessions, not just to sell them, but, but to give, the, give to the poor, give to the people who are really struggling. Go sell those things, store up, lay up some treasures in heaven, and then come follow me. And he was disheartened. He was saddened by it. He was sorrowful. This broke the man's heart. And Jesus went on. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. You know what's interesting about this? I'm going to pause here again for a second. I've heard so many sermons on whether Jesus is talking about a literal camel and, and a literal needle, or whether Jesus is talking about um, a literal camel and... And I have a needle being a gate going into a city. I've heard more sermons on trying to figure out what the needle is and what the camel is than I have on the heart of the message, which is this. If you really want to be my disciples, help people who can't turn life or turn life's lemons into lemonade. Help people who are suffering so greatly that they would be willing to leave their two-year-old kid behind to go find a better life. If that means selling everything that you own and laying that money down at the feet of people who are desperate for a new life, then that's what I want you to do. That's the heart of this message. How far are you willing to go not just to follow me, not just to be a good Christian, right? Again, this is, this is another American idea um, that Christianity is about putting an ichthus, the Jesus fish, slapped on the back of your trunk to show everybody that, you know, that you're a Christian that goes to church every Sunday, right? That's, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. It's not what it means to be a disciple of his. It means that you... You give of yourself, you give of your time, you give of your money, you give of, of your soul to help people who are so desperate that the only option that they see in front of them is death. That's it. And they would risk everything and give up everything, including their own children, to make it another day. I mean, the point of this story is that our heart needs to be set on helping people who are less fortunate than us. As Christians, right? Do good when? Always, right? 
Uh, not when times are good, not when times are productive, not when work is going well. You do good always, period. Um, I'm going to go on. Jesus, uh, well, let me back up. Verse 26. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? I, I think they're legitimately confused. Well, wait a second. We know a lot of rich people. Some of us have wealth. Are you saying we're not saved? Who, who can be saved? Jesus looked at them. L listen how many times. That's a third time now, right? Jesus looked at the rich man and loved him. Jesus, verse 23, Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, verse 27, Jesus looked at them and he said, with man it's impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. And then he just kind of leaves it there. Verse 28, Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. And I think Peter's like, at this point, he's like, Where are, are we safe? Jesus, we left every, we, we walked away from our business. We stepped out of the boat when you said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. We left everything. We didn't hand the business off. We didn't sell the business. We didn't make big bank. You know, when we left those boats, we literally left everything behind instantly and we followed you. And Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers, sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So what's the point of Jesus' message? What's the point of his story? Context is really important. And, and I'll talk about what kind of led Jesus into this story. Um, I'll talk about that here in a second. But I think Jesus' point is, is really, it's really strong. I think it's really clear. I think his message is, um, first of all, Peter, yeah, uh, I commend you for leaving everything and following me. The people who did that, the people who left everything behind to follow me, the people who have that level of a commitment, the people who are fully vested in the kingdom, the people who are, are unflinchingly willing to sacrifice it all, to put everything on the line, to follow me, to help your fellow man, you guys will inherit the kingdom. You'll receive all these things in return. Now, I don't think he's saying um, you're going to own all these, you know, all these mansions and, you know, you're going to, you're going to, your family's going to reproduce and you're going to have all these relatives that you never even dreamed you would have. I don't think he's saying that. I think what he's saying is within the kingdom, there's this thing where people become family and we share our possessions. Our possessions are no longer our possessions but they're gifts that we receive from God, and they belong to everybody. We, we are fully willing to share everything with each other, and in doing so, we receive unfathomable, unfathomable amounts of friends, family, um, places to lay our head down. Um, you know, I see this um, just being really well connected within the church. I mean... Natalie jokes about it. She's like, I can't go anywhere with you. Um, everywhere I go, I run into somebody I know. It doesn't, mat it doesn't matter. I've been on airplanes before, and I've seen people like, Jimmy, what are you doing on this flight? Like, it's being really well connected and knowing people everywhere shows me how incredibly generous people are. Um, because I have offers all the time, and I don't, I'm not in need. Trust me, I'm not in need. Uh, people have offered me a place to stay. Hey, if you're ever passing through, just look me up. You know, don't spend money on a hotel. Um, you'll have a place to lay your head down. And I think this is what Jesus is describing. In the kingdom, it ought to be like this, not just for privileged people, but for everybody. Jeff Pierre ought to have 
somewhere to lay his head down. I mean, if, if the kingdom really looked like what Jesus is describing, <clears throat> if people were truly, genuinely vested in the kingdom, <clears throat> if people were truly, genuinely giving of their time, of their money, of their resources, if they were that vested in the church, we wouldn't have churches that are like, oh, oh well, you know, we got to close our doors. We couldn't make it. I mean, that, it, it's, it's so backwards. What were you going to say, Tex? Uh, I, I think what we need to do as Christians, we need to stop being afraid of the church. We need to stop being afraid to impose. Let others bless us. We need to do that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I always said it, you know, it, it, it's, it's insulting to somebody who wants to give, even when we don't need, I mean, there are times, I mean, there are times where Natalie and I receive things that we just, we don't, we don't need. We're not, we're not in need. But when we do, you know, we say, saying no to somebody who wants to give is, is almost an insult. And it's saying that your, your gift doesn't mean that much to me. Uh, so we've taught our kids from, from a young age that it is absolutely more blessed to give than to receive. But when people want to gift you with something, take it um, and thank them and be appreciative and let them know that it is an absolute blessing to, to give. Um, and I think... Uh, well, let me talk about what, what kind of led to this conversation in Mark chapter 10. Um, this is a story that comes right before this rich man who approaches Jesus. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. Okay, that word for indignant... Um, I believe this is the only time that Jesus or that uh, Mark uses it. Uh, so it's the only time that Jesus gets he gets like viscerally agitated. Um, Jesus is not happy. I mean, gets angry. This is not like a like he was like ah you know like the word that's used here in the Greek language means that something welled up inside of him and that he got he got angry to the point of wanting to vomit. Right? Did you ever did you ever get that angry that you were so mad at somebody that you're you're holding back that um, the the dry heaving, right? Like you're shaking. Have you ever been that angry? And I'm not an angry person, um, but I can think of probably one or two times in my life where somebody has made me that angry, where I just I get I get sick to the stomach and I just want to punch them out. <laughs> um, I never did, never hit anybody, never would, um, but I've been there, right? I've been that angry, and this is the word that Mark uses for Jesus when people are stopping the kids from coming to him. Um, so he says, uh, he was indignant, and he said to them, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Interesting We'll pause there for a second. It's interesting because the guy who approaches Jesus says, what do I need to do to, what? Enter the kingdom of God. What do I need to do? And just prior to that, Jesus is angry to the point of vomiting because these people are blocking people, these little kids, from coming to him. And Jesus says that the kingdom belongs to little children. Like them. Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. Um, so I think, you know, Mark strategically puts these stories together for a reason. And I think what Jesus is saying is stop hindering people. 
Don't let your possessions hinder people from coming to the kingdom. If, if it's a, you know, the difference between life and death, sell everything and give it to those people in need. Stop hindering people from coming into the kingdom. Be fully vested, be fully committed, be fully, fully involved in loving people, in giving to people, in helping people. And so I'll, I'll wrap it up and, and just say this. Um, what do we do when even the lemons aren't good enough to make lemonade? Well, we, we help people. Um, if you're at a, at a point and a place in life where things are good, uh, things are good financially, things are good uh, spiritually, things are good emotionally, help people. Step in and help people. Um, if you come and you go and, you know, church isn't that important to you and... Um, it's just not high on your list of priorities. Put it at the very top of your list of priorities. Um, fellowship with people. Love people. Visit people. Call people. Send cards to people. Encourage people. Um, we've got to start networking much better as a body of believers. Um, with other congregations, other people, other individuals. Because this isolationism that we're experiencing within the church isn't working. And it's teaching people that you can only go so far in the kingdom and then you just kind of peter out and, and then you just throw your arms up and you're like, Ugh, well, we tried. I mean, I just don't see that in the Bible, do you? I mean... Do you see people that just peter out? They're like, well, we gave it our best. Right? That's, that's, a, that's a foreign concept to these people, but it's a foreign concept because Jesus taught them, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be worthy, he uses that term, right? I preached a couple sermons on that. If you want to be worthy of the kingdom, you've got to fully commit to follow me. Don't, don't plow and look behind you. You're not fit for the kingdom. Look straight ahead. Be fully committed. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. Right? It's this message of being fully vested in the kingdom, being fully committed, of helping people, of giving of your time and your money. So... You know, as I, as I finish this, you know, I kind of step back and, and I have like my ups and downs, you know, small church life is, it's challenging. Um, I think we would be in denial if, if we said it wasn't. So I have, you know, I have times where I'm, I'm just really down, I'm really discouraged. And then I step back and that's why last Sunday, I just went down through the list and said, here's how much we've helped give people in the last year. I mean, $26,000 before another $6,000 last Sunday. Do you realize for a congregation this size that that's absolutely unheard of? I see so many small churches struggling and they're just trying to survive. And I look at us and we're like, okay, we, like, we might be struggling, at least with life, right? Life has really thrown a couple... Uh, hard monkey wrenches in, in the last year. Uh, we've experienced so many losses, losses of life, um, tremendous losses. But I see this spirit of committed giving that comes, it wells up out of the hearts of people here. And as a result, people's lives are, are being changed. And I'll talk about this during the sermon. Um, the messages that I received out of Haiti this past week are absolutely exciting and incredible. Uh, people who are literally at the end of their rope saying, you, you are saving lives. 
Um, my good friend Julian, sent, he sent me a message yesterday. and he, I mean, this guy is absolutely elated. And um, I'll read some of his message during the sermon. And he's going to give a detailed update. Um, but he said, um, first of all, he sent me a selfie. And he just, he is smiling from ear to ear. He has this huge grin on his face. And he said, he said, brother, the reason I'm smiling is because I'm going and I'm helping people and I'm feeding them and I'm paying off their hospital debt and they're smiling. He said, brother, that's making me smile. And he said, this is only possible because you guys are helping us out. That's what the kingdom should look like. Um, so anyway, take that um, as you will, but I, I think it's just, it's an important reminder for us to keep moving forward and in those moments of discouragement, step back and remember that the, the kingdom is so powerful. God is so powerful. God's spirit is so moving. Um, God's generosity um, that, that wells up in your hearts is incredible. Um, there's, I, I really believe Jesus when he said, if, if you want to move that mountain, pray and it'll be done. Uh, we're seeing mountains being moved by this little congregation, and uh, it's incredible. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, we'll see you guys.